is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Greetings, Science Maximites. Get your hard outs out because today we're gonna be building things. Like I always say, what's the point of science if you can't use it to build cool stuff? And today's episode is called Stable Structures. Now, stables are the buildings where horses sleep. So, stable structures means... I think I have the wrong kind of stable. Today, we are going to be building a gumdrop dome. And gumdrops are already kind of dome-shaped, but they don't hold a lot of weight. Uh, yeah, can't hold much weight. But you can make it hold a lot of weight if you build a geodesic dome. A geodesic dome means a round shape made out of straight lines, and that's what I've made here. All I used is gumdrops and toothpicks. It's very easy to make, and I'll show you how to do it. First, you need to start with a pentagon, a five-sided figure. One, two, three, four, five. And then stick them all together, obviously, with toothpicks. Then what you want to do is you want to start making triangles. So you stick a toothpick in here and a toothpick in here, and then you put a gumdrop at the top of this triangle, just like this. And then you make another triangle here and here and here, and it becomes a whole bunch of triangles, you see? Easy to make as long as you start with a pentagon on the bottom. Now, once you've built one, I suggest you build two more because then you will have a stable base and you can see just how much weight these hold. Mm. Yeah. You want to you want to max it out? Okay. Let's max it out. Oh! Oh, a little collapsing. But still not bad for gumdrops, right? So there you go. The geodesic dome. That's what you research if you want to learn how to build one of these for yourself. But now, let's max this out even more. Okay, now I just need an expert to help me out. Do you like my new interface? It's good, right? Watch this. Hey, wait. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not, okay. Uh, wait, no, that's not the right gesture for that. But there's, it's all gesture based, so I gotta, uh, this? Nope, uh, this, nope. That, ooh, okay, um, expert, I want experts. Oh, 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 okay, it's voice activated, great. Uh, oh, Sarah from Mad Science, she'd be perfect for this. Good, close, 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 close. I can leave it running. Sarah? from Mad Science. Great to see you. Thank you. Great to be here. I like your lab coat. It's a really nice color. <laughs> Wait a minute. It's supposed to be yellow. It must have changed to orange in the portal. That's okay because I, this is not the first time that's happened, so I've installed a little uh, secret thing on the app that allowed me to get a new one from storage. Oh, Watch perfect. this. Huh. Didn't work. Oh well, I'll get another one later. All right, <laughs> anyway, we are going to max out the geodesic dome. Amazing, that's so cool. Yeah, so we just want to make it bigger. So how do we do okay. that? Okay, well, there's a couple ways we could do that. Um, we could add a few more points of connection, change the shape of it, make mm -hmm. it a little more complex so it's a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Or we can use the design right now and use different materials to make it bigger. Ah, okay, well, you know what? I think we should do both of those things. Okay. I think we should make it more complex and bigger, but why don't we start with bigger? Okay. But we'll use the simple, the simple design right here, and we'll just get like long wooden poles instead of toothpicks. Perfect, yeah, and then um, what will we use for the gumdrop? I guess we can't get big gumdrops, huh? No, I don't think so. Um, what about um, oranges? Huh? Ah, yeah, oranges could work. Maybe, yeah, because yeah. you could stick the poles in and then the oranges will be, okay. Yeah. We'll go to the Science Max fruit market and we'll get some oranges. Perfect. And I'll get a yellow lab coat. I don't know why that didn't work. Is this a maxed out number of oranges? I think so. It's, or is it just a medium doubt number? We don't really need many <laughs> more oranges than this. No. So, uh, there we go. So we got our oranges. Those are going to be our gumdrops and these wooden dowels will be our toothpicks. We just have to start with a pentagon, right? Yes. Five sides, so why don't we just lay that out and see what Perfect. it looks like here. We start building this dome the same as the gumdrop dome. So, like this. We stick the dowels into the oranges to make our five-sided pentagon. 
Good, like that. And then we go up from there by making a few triangles and sticking the oranges on the tops. Oh. But because the oranges are heavy, the triangles are pretty wobbly. That is, until we get them all connected with cross pieces. Yeah. After that, it seems to hold up pretty well. Okay, let's see if it holds it up. Whoa! <laughs> That's exciting. That is very exciting. Uh, let's do the same thing. So you make a triangle here, I'll make a triangle there, and then we'll connect them. Sounds good. Two layers, orange dome. I'm pretty excited about this. This is nice. Yeah. I'm surprised that the oranges actually hold it together because oranges aren't really that strong. No, exactly. But the structure itself is really strong based on the design of it. Yeah, because it's it's all about the shapes, right? Exactly. And we're using lots of triangles today, which are one of the strongest shapes on Earth. Ooh, strong. Well, then making something out of a lot of triangles makes it really strong. Exactly. Yeah. OK, so let's make that top layer of right. things. We only need one more orange. Yeah. This will be the one, top layer. Right in the middle. One orange on top with five dowels from each point and... Yeah! So good. <laughs> orange juice high five. In fact, it worked so well, there's only one thing left to do. Hmm, is there a way that we can maybe max it out even more? Watermelon? Watermelon. watermelon. Yeah. We could get the round watermelons. You ever yeah. seen those? They're like the size of a bowling ball or yeah. smaller, a little bit smaller? That's perfect. And they're nice and full inside, so they should be able to hold the uh, posts into place. Okay, we'll try it one more time with watermelon. Inside dome, high five. Yeah! You may have heard of cup stacking, and if not, you're missing out because not only is it fun, but it's something that kids are the world record holders at. And it's all about, you guessed it, stacking cups. Now, I have learned the pattern, but I'm not super fast at it. The world record is actually four seconds, and this is what that looks like. <laughs> but you can't use camera tricks to help you. You have to practice to get faster. Now, you don't need to use official sports stacking cups, but if you don't know your science, some things will work against you. First of all, these cups have holes in the bottom, which makes them not very good as, you know, cups. Why do they have holes in the bottom? Because of science. You see, when you pull the cups apart, there is air that needs to get inside this cup. If you don't have a hole, like these ones, the air makes them stick together because there's nowhere for the air to get in except for underneath, and they will stick. Once again, let's compare. Also, you want the cups to have some weight because if they have some weight, they'll fall out of each other easily. If they don't have any weight, like, say, these styrofoam cups, it becomes very difficult. And <sighs> cup stacking with trash cans. OK, here we go. Even though these trash cans were heavy, they didn't have holes in the bottom, which means they stuck together. A lot. So why didn't I drill holes in the bottom of these trash cans? OK, and then? Well, I needed them in episode six to make 11 barrels of slime. But I eventually did it. And time. Okay, there you go. The world record in trash can stacking. I know it's, it doesn't seem very fast, but first of all, that was hard. And second of all, I am the only one to do it. So therefore, I hold the record. <sighs> Sarah and I have already made a great dome out of oranges. Now we're maxing it out even more, but this time using... Watermelon! Watermelons! But not the giant watermelons, nope. the perfect spherical watermelons. They'll have to do pretty good to be better than the oranges. Definitely. All right, so we just do it the same way? Same way. All right. Let's do it. 
I'm sure I'm not telling you something you don't know when I say watermelons aren't great for building structures with. This is super wobbly. But the fact that we can make a structure using watermelons just proves how amazingly strong a geodesic <laughs> dome really is. Have we done it? Yeah. We've done it! Gumdrop dome. We've got our orange dome. And we've got our watermelon water dome. Those, these are awesome maxed out domes. What do we want to do to max it out even further? I think the watermelons were a little too heavy. Maybe we should go back to something lighter. Uh, so we can make it out of gumdrops, which will be yeah. like more complex. Exactly. And we won't get orange juice raining on our heads all day, yep. which is what happens with this one. Max Historica. This is Leonardo da Vinci. Ciao. One of the greatest inventors to ever live. And this is a pile of wood. One of the greatest piles of wood to ever be piled. Now, Leonardo is going to construct a bridge out of this wood. This is Leonardo's hammer. One of the worst hammers in the history of hammers. Now, Leonardo must construct his bridge using no tools at all. No, that hasn't been invented yet. How will Leonardo construct a bridge using no tools at all? Well, he is one of the greatest scientific minds... <laughs> oh, um, one of the greatest scientific minds in history. <sighs> oh -ho! Each piece of wood is supported by another. And that's what's known as Leonardo da Vinci's self-supporting bridge. Leonardo's done it! But there is a flaw in the bridge. It's very strong when you apply downward force, but not so strong when you push on it sideways. Fortunately, Leonardo can devote his great mind to figuring out how to clean up his workshop. Ha-ha! <laughs> Join me, one of the greatest narrators in the history of narration, next time on More Max Historica. Let's recap. Sarah and I have maxed out our simple geodesic dome, but now it's time to make it even more maxed out. We need to increase how complex our structure is. So right over here, we actually have a dome that's just made out of triangles. Ooh, look it, it's nothing but, there's a triangle there, there's a triangle there, triangle there, triangle. So all triangles. All triangles. And see how much bigger it is even th compared to our first one? Yeah. And that's just by adding more points. Over here we have one that uses pentagons and triangles. Ooh, let me see. Okay, so we got, uh, oh, there's a pentagon there. Yeah. There's a pentagon there. And then we got triangles here. Yeah. Um, can we go bigger than this? Because this is good, but this is still not, this is not maxed out enough. Sarah had the idea of lengthening the poles. Tish kebab skewers, I love those. I use those all the time in my science experiments. And making a bunch of pieces that fit together. So we just make a whole bunch more of these. Yep. And then we'll make some sort of big dome. <laughs> this is awesome! So we maxed it out, and it worked great. But gumdrops started to become a little hard to work with. Every time I do one attachment, oh. another one comes apart. So I had to get inside to hold it up with my head. Hmm. I think I've got an idea. Oh, yeah? Right back, yeah. Oh. Okay, but should I get out, or, or should I... It's okay, I can stay in. I can just keep fixing while it, it's collapsing a bit. But it's okay. Wait, this is inside. No, this is outside. Wait, hold on. Help, Sarah? Hey, oh, my. It kind of collapsed a little bit. Gumdrops, they just don't have the strength. Exactly. I was thinking we could use something a little more sturdy, maybe like some cardboard. Oh, yeah, and it doesn't move at all. We can totally make this, we'll max this out. I, I'll just put this over here. Okay, <laughs> fair right. enough. Okay. <laughs> If you want to build a block tower, you might think the fastest way to do it is just by building a single stack of blocks. But science may have a few things to say about that, and those things would be no. Let's try it with books. The books are much wider than the blocks, so that will give me a wider base, right? But it's all about the center of mass. You compare how wide it is to how tall it is. Right now, it's pretty wide and it's not that tall, so the center of mass might be around here. But if you go high enough, how high it is compared to how wide it is changes a lot. It's getting higher, but not any wider. 
it's the center of mass is probably uh, right around there somewhere, which means it's gonna be really hard to balance. That, whoa, care, careful, almost. I can do a little bit more, I bet. Oh, careful, careful, whoa. It'll only get so tall. So there you go. You can never stack a single stack of anything very high. But just in case you don't believe me, let's max it out. Ah, ha, ha, oh, careful. Now it's time to see how high, whoa, whoa, how high I can make a single stack of boxes. Okay, and it, whoa, six boxes, six boxes, six boxes, whoa. Can he go as high as 12? Let us find out if I can go as high. Apparently not. Can he go as high as 11? Can he go as high as 11 boxes? Let's find out. Oh, careful. 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 And... Ha-ha! A single stack of boxes! Huh. Okay, well, like I said, you can't stack a single stack of things too high, because it will, it will fall. Ha-ha! Science! 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 This is a pencil. You probably have one of these at home and use it for all kinds of interesting things like writing and drawing, and that may be it. But if you have a lot of pencils, you can build stuff. I'll show you some of my favorite pencil builds. Check this out. It's a pencil cube. If you want to try building one yourself, you build it like this. Get a piece of foam and then lay out 11 pencils this way, and then another 11 that way, so they make a nice square. Then take sharpened pencils and stick them into the foam in all the gaps. Go all the way around and then keep adding more layers of pencils and eventually you will have a cube. Now, if you don't have 366 pencils at home, you can do the same thing with toothpicks. Now, if you want to research this on your own to find the instructions, just try looking up pencil cube. Okay, that's not the only thing we can build with pencils. Check this out, a pencil asterisk. Phil, can you max it out and add some more pencils? Yeah, so I did. I maxed it out with even more pencils. And then I thought, well, could I max it out again? So I did. This is what it looks like with even more pencils. And in fact, I removed the inside pencils and the whole thing still stays together. And then of course, this is the maximum number of pencils you can do with this configuration because as you can see, it starts to become a sphere and you kind of run out of pencil length. There you go, maxed out pencil structures. Of course, I've used all of my pencils, but that's okay, I will buy some more. I will just write myself a note to buy more. Actually, there are sharpened pencils on the bottom of my pencil cube, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll just write this note with the pencil cube. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, ready? One, two, three. It's not sharpened. Oh, here we go. Where'd my book go? Ooh, look at Sarah and I have maxed out a geodesic dome out of gumdrops, oranges, watermelons, and more gumdrops. But now we're making one using glue and cardboard circles. Are those the same distance? After a bunch of time assembling and gluing, we have a giant maxed out dome. Okay. There, are we done? I think so. We're done! Yeah! Yeah! Max out dome, how many points do we have? Oh, so many. Can you, do you think we can lift it? I think so. I think so. that's yeah. the top, try it. See. Okay, whoa. whoa, wait, 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 we can spin it. It was really light and also really strong. Strong enough to hold upside down. As a fruit bowl, it'd be pretty good. This is so strong, I'm surprised at how strong this structure is. There you go, Science Max, experiments at large, geodesic dome, and now it's sort of a geodesic disco ball. I like it. Whoa, 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 okay, careful. Careful, careful. All right, putting it down, putting it down. <laughs> Behold, 
Science Maximites, I am Viltron 2.0. I have changed myself into a cyborg to give myself super strength. No longer will I suffer the weakness of human muscles. Behold my awesome strength. Tremble in fear at my might. I will... Hmm. I may have to give myself some upgrades. Uh, yeah, so... Okay, maybe I'll just give myself super strength the old-fashioned way, using the power of science. Today is all about mechanical advantage, like this fulcrum and this lever, transferring a lot of force over a short distance or a little bit of force over a long distance and vice versa. We are going to be building a trebuchet. A trebuchet. So a trebuchet looks a lot like a catapult, but a catapult uses elastic force to throw something, and a trebuchet uses the good old lever. There's a lot of weight on the short end of the lever, and on the other side of the pivot is the long end, and we've got a sling here with a marble in it, and we put that down here on the ground, and then we let it go, and whoosh, whoosh, it throws the marble. To build your trebuchet, here's what you need. Something to be your lever, like a pencil. Something to be your weight, I used batteries. You'll need to make a frame, and I use craft sticks and cardboard for that. A way for it to pivot, like a straw and a shish kebab skewer. Then you'll want a sling, which is a rope, and something to hold your projectile, like plastic netting. Finally, something to hold it all together, like glue. Get your craft sticks, make some triangles with one craft stick sticking up. Then get your craft sticks and make a base, a base which you will put on with your cardboard like that. Now you'll also probably want to make some extra supports that go off the bottom there like that. Then get your pencil and cut a piece of straw so that you can see right through it and you can get a shish kebab skewer and you stick it through the straw like that and that's your pivot point, your fulcrum for your lever. What you want to do is put your weights, I've used some batteries, you can use anything that's heavy, on the short end of the lever. That's important because a lot of weight here translates to a little bit of weight going a lot faster on the other end. So, a lot of weight on the short end, and then on the long end of the pencil where the eraser is, you want to take a toothpick and stick it into the top of the eraser and then cut it off so it's just like that. That creates a little hook that you put the loop of your string net on so that when it gets flipped around, the loop comes off and then throws your projectile that way. And then of course you need something that you want to fire. I like to use marbles, but gumdrops work pretty well because they're nice and soft. And you put it in and you pull it all the way down, all the way so it's actually resting on the cardboard like this. And then you let it go and it fires. And there you go, a trebuchet. Now, if you want to research how to build one of these yourself, it is called a trebuchet. Ha <laughs> ha, I can make it come up, but I can't make it go away. I don't know why that works like that. Anyway. So we need to max out the trebuchet. Let's see, I need an expert. Um, oh, Chris. Chris from Logics Academy has a trebuchet. Maybe we can use that one to figure out how we can max it out. And of course, because it's a trebuchet and it's maxed out, we want to fire something. So I thought we would fire <laughs> pumpkins. Let's go. Good luck, little pumpkin. How's it going? Chris from Logics Academy. I uh, had a problem with the pumpkin. It kind of got larger than I expected. It's okay, I think this one's uh, bigger than what we need anyway. Chris shows me a scale model trebuchet. One we can use to test a few ideas before building our maxed out version. Oh, and you've got little mini pumpkins! I know, don't get, <laughs> don't get too attached. The first is the arm length, getting the right ratio. That means how long one side of the lever is compared to the other. When talking about a ratio, you write it like this. One to two. It doesn't matter what the actual measurement is, just that this side of the lever is one of that measurement and this side is two, or two times longer than this side. And it turns out a one to two ratio arm wasn't great. Well, that could be better. It could be better. Mm. So we tried a one to six ratio arm. 
The one to six arm through the pumpkin further, but not a lot further. Better, <laughs> that's gonna be better. Better? Then we tried a one to four. Turns out one to four is the best arm ratio. Whoa! <laughs> that's pretty good. Chris also had an idea about hanging the weights. Because as you see here, these go straight down. And going ah. straight down actually makes this spin even faster. So when we do the big one, we should hang the weights off the end and not attach them to the end. That's right. And that, that'll give you some extra distance. Excellent. Let's fire this last one. OK. Three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah. OK, I wonder when we make the big one, do you think we can get it through the goal posts? Oh, yeah. I think we can do that. <laughs> All right, let's try it. All right. This episode is all about giving yourself super strength using mechanical advantage. Well, here's how you can use a rope to give yourself the strength of a superhero! Ha-ha! I am mechanical advantage using a rope man! advantage using a rope, you need three things. First thing, a rope. I mean, obviously, that, that's a given, right? You, you know you need a rope. OK, good. Then you need something to pull and something that will not move. What you do is you tie your rope to the thing that you want to pull. Then you tie the other end of the rope, you guessed it, to the thing that won't move. Now you pull from the middle like this. And it's very easy to pull the weight. Why? Because of mechanical advantage. You're using a small amount of force over a longer distance. But what if the weight is heavier? Then you lengthen the rope. Now we pull from the middle and it's easier. Why? Yes, mechanical advantage. A small amount of force over an even longer distance makes it easier to pull the weight. Let's max it out. Mechanical advantage using a rope man, away! High above the city, mechanical advantage using a rope man surveys the town looking for someone in trouble. There's someone. Oh, my minivan broke down and only 10 feet from my parking spot. If only there was someone who could help me. I'll help you. Mechanical advantage using a rope, man. I'm saved. Maybe you should try giving yourself some mechanical advantage using the rope. Mechanical advantage using a rope, man. Yes. Well, I was coming to that. So I have this really long rope and I tie one end to something that's not going to move, like a tree. Or a steel coil, if you happen to have one. And then I take the other end, and I run all the way back, and I attach this end to the van. I call her Bessie. Then I go to the middle of the rope, and I pull on it sideways like this, giving myself a huge amount of mechanical advantage. Oh, it's working! It's working! Pulling, pulling. <laughs> Mechanical advantage using a rope, man! You're doing it! <laughs> well, gee willikers, you did it! Mechanical advantage using a rope, man! You pulled the whole van! And that's how you can use a rope to give yourself super strength! I am Mechanical Advantage using a rope, man! Based on what we've learned from our small-scale trebuchet, Chris and I made a maxed out version! <laughs> All right. This, I think, wow. is as big as we could possibly be expected to build this. This is huge. We have uh, our the length of our arm, which right. is important. Yes, and we've got to add weight here, so yep. we're going to like loop this in. Whoa! Oh, I guess that's because I took the weight off. Yeah. So, the arm is four times longer on this side of the lever. Right. And on that side of the lever. Right, so this arm goes four times faster than that side. But... But we're gonna need a lot of weight. Like our small version, we needed to hang weights on the back of our trebuchet. So I got a rope and put some weights on. But because our new version is so maxed out, we need a lot of weight, which I needed to get on a rope. Okay. 
and drag it over. Okay, I'm here. And I needed to lift it onto the arm. I needed to lift it onto the arm. I lift it. You know, maybe we should do this together. Okay. And okay. you take one end. And we lifted it. That's uh, that's gonna be a problem, Phil. I'm kind of glad that happened because there was no way I was going to be able to lift that. <laughs> I know, it was way too heavy and we need something stronger that can still hold the weight and still give us the hinge that we want at the top. And once the weight's up there, if the rope broke... That would be bad news. That, that'd be big time bad news. Okay, so we need a new solution for getting the weights on the trebuchet that is not... Not rope. We need something stronger and hopefully that still has the hinge on it up here. Maybe we have some sort of bar system that we could hang. Yeah, I'm thinking metal. Yeah, like, yeah, metal, definitely metal. Definitely metal. Metal is better than rope. I think so. For holding a whole bunch of weight. Okay, let's okay. get that done. Let's do it. All right. I got some metal over in the shop over here. Okay. Come on down to Sal's science shop. I am Sal, and this is my science shop. You want levers? I got the best levers around. Little levers, big levers, all drastically reduced. If you can find a lever anywhere else for less, then you gotta tell me, because I didn't know anybody else was selling them. Come on down to Sal's science shop, your one-stop shop for science. Hey, you want some levers? Well, boom, have I got levers. What class would you like? What's that? You didn't know that levers have different classes? Well, there are three different classes of levers. First class, business class, and coach. <laughs> no, first class, second class, third class. It's pretty straightforward. And what do we need when we have a lever? We need a load, we need a fulcrum, and we need a lever. <laughs> first class lever, the fanciest of levers. You got your load on this end, you got your fulcrum right here underneath, and then you put some effort into this end, and wow, look how easy that is. Ha <laughs> ha, first class. What kind of thing works like that? Oh, I don't know. How about this trebuchet you've been spending all this time watching? First class lever right there in front of you. Second class lever. Look, there's a load right here in the middle. The fulcrum's on this end, and you put your effort in at this end, and you lift it, and look, it's a second class lever. Huh? How cute is that? But what kind of thing works like that? It's like a wheelbarrow. The fulcrum is the wheel. The load goes in this. I guess this is the barrow. And then I lift with the handles. Huh? Look at that. Ha! Lever! Third class lever! You got your load on this end, you got your fulcrum on this end, but where is the effort? The effort's in the middle, and it pivots while you move it. Huh? Huh? Where are you gonna get that kind of crazy contraption? Salad tongs! Salad tongs! Salad tongs. Look, you put the effort in, in the middle there, it pivots on that end, and you have the load there. And there you go, first class, second class, and third class levers. Whatever your mood, we've got the levers for you. Chris and I had some trouble getting the weights on our maxed out trebuchet. Yeah. <sighs> that's, uh, that's gonna be a problem, Phil. So we had to come up with a new system. A metal bar that pivots on the bottom of the lever arm. It's got lots of spots for weights, and we could lift the weights one at a time to attach them all. We start out with 255 pounds. How many kilograms is that? 113.3 uh, continues. Yeah, that's what I got, too. All right, that's definitely enough weight, right? Definitely. OK, let's fire a pumpkin. Let's do it. <laughs> this trebuchet works the same as the other models, but because it's so much larger, we really need to haul on the rope. We attach the arm to a quick release, which allows us to hold it in place until we're ready to fire. Oh, here we go. Okay. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Whoa! 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 We launched a bunch of the same size pumpkins and got a pretty good idea of how far we were throwing them. Oh! <laughs> wow. Okay, 
You know what? We should leave this here so that we know how far that last pumpkin went. And then try to beat it. And then we try to beat it. We haven't gotten through the goalposts. It seemed to handle the more weight pretty well. I think we can we can add even more. What do you think? I think we should add all of the weight. Okay. This is science max. Let's, this is not like science minimum. Let's max it out. We totally max it out. Okay, all the weight. All, all the weight. All the weight. Max Historica. Good morrow to you. I am Lord Fillington the Fourth, and welcome to my medieval castle. My father, Lord Fillington the Third, had his castle besieged by catapults, and he had to share his prized collection of snow globes. Well. I, Lord Fillington the Fourth, have made a few improvements. First was forgetting about snow globes. Those are so last season. I collect limited edition science maximal stuff toys. <laughs> and I've collected them all, and I'll never share. <laughs> Hello? Hello? That Lord Fillington has been hogging all the limited edition science maximals, and he won't even trade. I mean, look, I've got three floofers, and all I need is a fricto, but he won't trade. Surely you can trade. Never. I have all the frictos, and I'll never trade. <laughs> That's it. Time to build it. Oh, you're going to build a catapult and knock my castle walls down? Well, I've learned a thing or two from my father. I, too, have catapults. Release! <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we've got a new invention of our own, a trebuchet. Oh, fiddlesticks, they have a duck pate. Trebuchet. A what? A Mother's Day? A Hudson's Bay? Trebuch a cabernet? I can't hear you. You've got to come closer. <sighs> Release! <laughs> <laughs> The trebuchet was the best thing around right up until the invention of gunpowder. It could throw farther than anything else, even catapults. What you do, you see, is you put something in there, and then you put a big weight up there, right? And this goes down, that flies around, and flies over the castle walls, all from far enough away where he can't get me with his catapults. And it works like this. Three, two, one. No, it doesn't make it. It's too high. It's too high. Ah! All right, all right, I give up. I'll trade. Oh, <laughs> that's quite nice. I like that. Oh. <laughs> and that's how trebuchets were used in history. <laughs> sort of. Our giant trebuchet launched a pumpkin pretty far. Oh! <laughs> Very cool. But now it's time to max it out further by adding even more weight. All the weight, all, all right. the weight, all the weight. So we increase the weight to 425 pounds. That's a lot of weight. Okay, are we ready? I think so. I can't wait to see what this thing does. I can't wait to see how heavy it is to pull. Turns out, pulling that much weight using our rope was really tough, even with the mechanical advantage of our lever. There we go. We found another pumpkin of the same size, but then we started having another problem. Three, two, two one, go! Whoa, look at how high it is! What? Whoa! <laughs> go! Whoa! What? Whoa! <laughs> so, I think we're going a little too high. Yes. It was almost straight up. How far the pumpkin goes all comes down to when the rope slips off the pin at the end. If the rope slips off too early, the pumpkin goes up and not very far. Too late and the pumpkin goes straight, which means it had hit the ground sooner and doesn't go as far. A 45 degree angle is just right. And how do you adjust it? By simply bending the pin. Three, two, two. One! Whoa! Oh. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> great. That went way farther than 60. We should have had oh, another sign. I don't even know how far that went. Yeah! There you go. Science Max experiments at large. Trebuchet. So, one of us has to clean up the pumpkins, and the other one has to put the trebuchet away. Right. Um, pumpkins! <laughs> Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max. 
Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today we're gonna be looking at water. But water is very heavy, but that's okay because we need it to be heavy for this experiment to work. I don't know if I need that much of it though. Maybe I can get, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, that's probably all I need. Today, we're going to be building a water-powered car. You'll need a base for your car, like this styrofoam, water bottles, shish kebab skewers, straws, scissors, elastics, paper plates, tape, a square of paper towel, modeling clay, vinegar, baking soda, water, and glue or a hot glue gun if you have an adult to help you, and... Uh, yeah, I know, this one is pretty involved. That's why you should go to the website for step-by-step -step instructions. Take your paper plates and glue two together to make a wheel. Then make three more. Wrap elastics around your base and then tape straws on the bottom. Trim them down, maybe about that much. Then take your shish kebab skewers and push it through a water bottle cap to make a hole. Then stick one wheel on, put the skewer through the straw, and do the same thing on the other three sides. Then take the water bottle cap and get an adult to help you make a perfect hole in it so that it fits your straw. Then use some modeling clay and hot glue to seal the straw and the cap so it's airtight. Attach the water bottle to the base of your car, then fill it with some water and vinegar. Next, you'll want to wrap up a spoonful of baking soda in the square of paper towel so you can make a little package. Finally, stick something underneath the underside of the bottle to raise the end up off the base. Bring your cap and then go outside. Ah, here we are outside. Yeah, I know, we're not really outside, but I have a science lab and you probably don't, so I highly recommend you do this outside. And don't forget your safety glasses. Now, this is why we make a little packet of baking soda, because we want to delay this reaction as long as we can. So I like to hold it there. We'll hold it there with one finger so I can get the cap ready, because we don't want it to react until we can get the cap on and then kink the straw to keep the pressure inside till we're ready to let it go. Then at the last second, you want to drop that packet in and quickly cap it and kink the straw. And woohoo! <laughs> there you go, a water-powered car. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute, that's a vinegar and baking soda-powered car? Well, kind of. The vinegar and baking soda create a gas, and that gas creates pressure in the bottle, and that pressure forces the water out of the bottle. But it's the water leaving the bottle that creates the thrust. The water going that way pushes the car that way. Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So what we're gonna do is max out the water-powered car. Figure out how to get water going that way so we can go that way. But we means me and someone else. Who can help me? Oh, I know, Anthony from the Ontario Science Center. He'd be great at this. Hopefully he's not busy. We're gonna max out the water-powered car. Ha. Phil, oh, sorry about that. Did I scare you? Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, how you doing? Awesome, thanks. Wait, I was wondering if I could get your help on an experiment. Yeah, okay. Which one? Uh, I'm building a water-powered car. It's gonna be great. It's Science of Max Headquarters. I'll, I'll show you. Phil? Anthony? Phil? I'm here. What? Phil, where are we? Oh, this is the parking lot for Science Max Headquarters. Oh, so, okay. today, yeah. I want to max out the water car. This thing is awesome. Yeah, so what you do is you use vinegar and baking soda, yeah. and you pressurize this container, and, okay. and the water shoots out that way. So the car goes this way. Ah, Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, you know okay. your stuff. This okay. is why you're here. This is because I could really use your help and advice on how to make this bigger. Okay, so we're gonna need a bigger tank to pressurize. Uh, so this, what about something like this? So we need something that can hold pressure. Do you think this would work? I don't know if we'd wanna... And we'd have to put like pressure fittings on the barrel, like like cut a hole yeah. and weld them on. I don't know if that's... Something tells me this wouldn't work. So okay, need, sure. Um... I got some other stuff over there maybe that we could uh... use. Oh, ah, ah, check this out. Yeah, I think this would work. This would work a lot better. Well, this is my stand-up washtub base. Your what? So yeah. we'll, we'll reuse it. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm thinking yeah. now, though? Uh, I know yeah. this 
the problem is I think this is like an oil drum, right? It and, is. And it's, a, it's an oil tank from a house. And these things are not built for pressure. You can get water tanks that you pressurize. Oh, uh, like hot water heaters. Yeah, you can uh, pressurize. They're built for that stuff. You pressurize them in your basement, and then the water travels up to, to like, the top your floor. shower that or makes... something like that. So we, all we need to do is get a pressurized water tank. OK. Put water in it, put pressure in it, and put it on wheels. <laughs> and then we <laughs> open sounds... the valve, and it goes, right? That sounds amazing. All yeah, right. let's get to it, man. OK. okay we I got to... some water tanks over here in this corner of the parking lot. Seriously? Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Busta Bika, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. When you're a professional chef like me, you spend lots of time perfecting the perfect recipes. I know my way around a kitchen, and today I'd like to show you one... That's not the fridge. Oh. <laughs> today I'd like to show you one of my favorites. Quail truffle gazpacho cakes on a plate of ice. Oh. Beautiful. And here's how to make it. Take some quail, some truffle, and some gazpacho and put it into a cake. Delicious. And here's the interesting part. How to make the plate of ice. Ooh. How did I do it? Well, I tried many different methods, and none were very successful. <laughs> but now I let science do the work for me. So here's what I do. You see, I've got my large block of ice, and I've got a fishing line over the top, and on the bottom, I've got two heavy weights. Now we wait. The heavy weights put pressure on the fishing line. This pressure melts the ice where it's pressing down. As the ice melts, the fishing line moves through the block of ice and eventually cuts its way through. There we are. My hours of waiting have almost paid off. You see, I've got a perfect line through the ice, and I stopped it just before it finished. It's the pressure of the line on the ice that makes it work. The same thing happens when you use ice skates. You see, it's a very thin line, and your body weight presses down on the ice, melts it a bit, and that allows you to glide across the ice. It also allows me to just pop this off. There you are, you see? Perfect plate of ice to put my delicacy on. Let's just try that now. There we go. Um... So I've joined Anthony, and we're going to max out our water-powered car. Our small design works by creating gas, which creates pressure, which forces the water out of the bottle, creating thrust. Our new plan is to get a water tank, put it on wheels, and put water in it. Then we use an air compressor to pressurize the air inside. When we open the valve, the water is forced out this way, which causes our water car to go that way. Okay. Ha-ha! <laughs> so, water car, maxed out version. Aha, uh -huh, huge. Water tank. And filled with lots of water and lots of, uh, lots of air. Through. Yeah. Pretty good, right? Whoa. It's a lot of it. So, did it mess up, did it mess up my hair? Uh, no, you look fine, you look great. Okay, good. Now, the only thing left is we just gotta open uh, this valve here, right? Yeah. You wanna do the honors? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it, okay. Okay, here right. we go. Three, two, one, go! go! We open the valve and our pressurized tank moves forward. The air pressure in the tank forces the water out with enough force to move the tank. Awesome! That was awesome! That was a great run, yeah! That was amazing! So, pressurized water tank on wheels. Totally worked. Totally worked. Total success, yeah. Um, so, because this is Science Max, the only thing we can do now is make it bigger. Bigger, right? exactly, okay. yeah. So, uh, problem is, I don't think we're gonna find a tank bigger than this one. Yeah. Um, so, because then it would be too heavy, right? Exactly. Much way too bigger. Heavy. Maybe maybe what we can do is just get a lot more water, okay. and then and then we find a way to pressurize the water. Oh, so don't pressurize the whole tank, just just the stream of water that's going out As of the tank. As it comes out, exactly. Something kind of like a like a fire hose. A fire hose, right? So so we take a big container of water, right? And we I guess we would need a pump. Yeah, like a pump would be perfect. So yeah. then we we suck the water out of the container, put it through the pump to pressurize it, shoot it out of a wa uh, fire hose. Uh huh. And then our car. Goes flying. Goes flying. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. All right. Amazing. Me, 
When water is going fast, it has a lot of force. This is a power washer. It's made for cleaning concrete and wooden decks, but it doesn't use soap and it doesn't use heat. It only uses the power of water. Let's try it out. The power washer creates a stream of water that is moving really fast. It has the force to clean concrete, strip the paint, or even the Science Max logo off wood. But how do I max out the power washer? What's the most ultimate use I can think of? Power washer pumpkin carving. The power of the pressure washer creates a stream of water strong enough to make short work of my pumpkin. Power washers may only shoot water, but they can be dangerous, so don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, science! The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic and you'll be granted entry. Send in the next candidate. Oh, no, not Overwhelmo. Did someone say Overwhelmo? No, wait, no, next. Oh, not that. Okay, okay, good, okay. Behold, it is I, Overwhelmo! Welcome back, Overwhelmo. If you can truly demonstrate magic, you may join the Wizard Academy. A glass of water! <laughs> no, no, wait, that is not a hot trick. Okay, hold on. Okay, and this, a waterproof playing card. I put the card on the glass and flip it upside down, and then I say the magic word. The magic word. And behold, magic! <laughs> Yes? Is that it? Yes? Well, it's not magic. It is defying gravity! No. Nope. The water would fall and the card would fall to the floor. It's not magic. This is magic! No, it's science. Horse feathers! Look, the reason the water doesn't come out is the air at the top of the glass keeps it held in by suction. More air would have to get into this glass to decrease the suction, and because the playing card is keeping a seal on the glass, the suction of the air is holding the weight of the water up. Boulder Dash! Uh, all right, look, let's do a little experiment then, shall we? Let's move the playing card just a little bit from the edge of the glass. You see those bubbles? Yes. That's bad news. <gasps> Science, not magic. Well, I will return, and then you will see your mind will be melted by by the. No, that's not my music. Hold, hold. Will you will rue the day when? That's not my new hold. Overwhelmo shall return. Our maxed out water car worked pretty well. Now it's time for something even more maxed out. We start with a giant tank on wheels. We add a pump to pressurize the water and a fire hose to shoot it out the back. What's more, this version is big enough for me and Anthony to ride. Water car! So Amazing! This is the more super improved water car. This no. tank holds 1,000 liters. And right now it has 720 liters of water. We have a pump. A pump, that's water right, pump. our water pump. So the idea is we take the water from this container out through your hose, really pressurized, going really fast that way. Our car goes really fast this way. All we gotta do is just turn on the pump and we're ready to go. So we fire up the pump and the water stream comes out really strong. So strong I can barely hold on to it. Yeah. But even so, there's a problem. Yeah. 
When did it happen? No, nothing really. Well, something happened. We got wet, but it didn't really. Okay. It's too heavy. It's too heavy. So you're on it, and I'm on it. That's a lot of weight. So we don't this. ride it. That's something. Yeah. And also, this is kind of going crazy. Yeah. Because if nobody's holding it, it's just going to flap around. So we'll have a brace here. Yeah. Shoots it that way. That's good. And then we'll need, I feel like we'll need something to kind of propel it. Maybe a better propulsion system. Kind of like uh, one of those steamboats. So we put a big paddle wheel here. Exactly. And we aim it, I guess we aim it like down. down at the, yeah, exactly. Like that. And then at the paddle wheel, and then the paddle wheel spins, and that propels the car. Exactly. Right? Right. OK. OK, we, well, we can do that. Let's do it. Sounds good, yeah. Put together. You know what? I have a paddle wheel because I had a failed hydroelectric. This is called flyboarding. <laughs> Powerful jets of water are being shot out from this board at my feet. Whoa. The engine on the watercraft behind me creates the water pressure, which travels up the hose and through the jets. The force of the water is strong enough that I can use it to fly around. So what's the difference between this and a water car? Well, we don't have to take that much water with us because it starts in the lake and ends up in the lake. So the only water I have to carry is in the hose that goes up to the platform. <laughs> Flyboarding is lots of fun, but it takes some practice to get it right. Bouncing on jets of water isn't easy, but I got the hang of it. It's all due to Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Oh. Physics! Our maxed out water car didn't work so well. The main reason is that that much water is heavy. 720 kilograms. Yeah. So Anthony and I have a plan. Rather than rely on the force of the water going straight out the hose, we're gonna put a water wheel on the back of the water car. A water wheel works by catching water in the segments of the wheel. The weight of the water on one side of the wheel causes it to start turning. But we're gonna use the weight of the water and the pressure of the water. Hopefully, both combined will be enough force to turn the wheel, which will drive our water car forward. A little construction, and we have it ready to go. Okay, so here's the latest version of the water car, water wheel! Yeah. All right. Yeah, there we, go. we try it out, but there's a problem. The trick with the water car is the water itself weighs a lot. Every liter is one kilogram, so our 720 liters we start with is way too heavy to get the car moving in the beginning. But as the water gets pumped out, there's a sweet spot where the weight is low enough the water car might move. But then there's only a little water left, so it's a balancing act. We fill it again and see if we can come up with a plan. Okay, new and improved version, only half full. So the idea this time is because we're starting with it only half full, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Then it'll begin to go a little easier because it won't have as much weight as it had the last time we did it. And Phil, oh, yeah? I can't even move this thing. What? I don't, I don't think, I think there's too much fuel. There's too much. Yeah, there's no way we can move this. There's no way this is gonna be able to move. Even awesome. half full. You even can't half full. Move it. I think we need less fuel. We're gonna get down to like maybe like a quarter or something like that. The thing is, we ran it from the full tank last time, and it and it never, okay, it so never moved at all. What if what if we gave it like a, a push to kind of help it get over that little like that little bump of energy? Ah, oh, so give it a, the 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 first push when it's a, still got a bunch of water in it. We give it a bit of a push, and then maybe it'll go in its exactly, own. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Or yeah. Itself? Absolutely. Let's okay. do it. We start the pump and wait for the amount of water to get to just the right spot. Then we give it a push while it's still kind of heavy to start it moving. Sure enough, that push makes all the difference. Yeah, it's the water car is light enough to roll, has some momentum to keep it going, and the force of the water coming out the pump is enough to keep it moving forward on its own. Still going! Oh. All right! Like a 
beauty. It worked all, it went all the way. That way. Yeah. Way to go. The water car, finally, a success. It was the push. It was the push. That's all we needed to get it going. A bit yeah. of a push to get it going and a lot less water. And uh -huh. there you go. It totally works. All right, you want to do it again? Absolutely. All right, yes. here we go. Okay. See you next time on Science Max Experiments at Large. So much See easier you. to push it without any water inside it. Behold the power of states of matter. Greetings, Science Maximites. <laughs> I'm Phil McCordick. <laughs> I think I overdid it with the fog machine. Uh, this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Can you even see me? Let's, let's go over here. Today we're talking about states of matter. Now there are three main states of matter. Solid, like this table. Liquid, like the water in this beaker. And gas. Yes, thank you. And we're also gonna be looking at the things that kinda go in between. Things that are sometimes solid, sometimes liquid. Like cornstarch mud, which is very easy to make. All you need is water and cornstarch, which you can get at the grocery store. Mix it up however much you want. Just remember, two parts cornstarch to one part water. Twice as much of this, then you have of that. Very easy, mix it up and you get cornstarch mud, which sort of seems like a liquid unless you hit it. And then it becomes solid. But if I pour it, it's a liquid. Even if I hold it in my hand and I hit it really fast, it turns into a ball and it will stay in a ball as long as I keep hitting it or squeezing it. But as soon as I stop, it turns into a liquid again. Now we're gonna max this out. We'll go through the portal and learn more about solids, liquids, and gases. Yeah, right. That's why I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training at, oh no wait, that's the code for the fog machine. Wait, uh, stop, stop, it seems to be stuck. Oh, uh, never mind, never mind. Uh, I'll fix it later. <laughs> Uh, right. Hey, Judy, how are you? Hi, Phil, how are you? Good. Judy is going for her PhD in chemistry, right? Yes. Fantastic, because that means you can explain cornstarch mud to me. Now, is this a solid or is it a liquid? Well, it kind of has properties of both. It's called a non-Newtonian fluid, uh -huh. so that makes it a liquid. A liquid? Well, I mean, it pours like a liquid, but when you hit it, it's a solid. So why does it turn solid when you hit it? So when you're pouring it, the particles are still far apart, uh -huh. so they can't interact with each other, and so they stay a liquid. But when you're hitting it, you're jamming the particles together, and they line up to become a solid. Now, does it still work the same way if we have a lot more of it? Uh, it should. Great, because I've got this 20 kilogram bag of cornstarch, and I have 34 more of them. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, but I think you'll need a much bigger container. N much bigger container, great. Um, I got some wood over there. I want you to go, and I'll follow you. All right. I'll follow you. I got, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, thanks, Ramona. And give me one of them fizzy drinks. Not too fizzy, just sort of medium fizzy. Thanks a lot. Hello, do you have trouble knowing what is a solid, liquid, or gas? Are you confused by jello? I mean, which is it? Is it a solid or is it a liquid? Water is a liquid, but what about when it's ice? Well, you gotta know your states of matter. There are three main states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And there are three rules that you need to figure out which one of them is which. Does it flow? Does it fit the shape of its container? And can you squeeze it? Rule number one, does it flow? Solid, liquid, gas. Here's a gas, does it flow? Do the particles pour over each other and cascade down? Yeah, yeah they do. Does a liquid flow? Yeah, yeah it does. Does a solid? Nope. Rule number two, what happens when you put it in a container? Does it take the shape of the container? Gases take the shape of the container. Liquids takes the shape of the container. Solids do not take the shape of their container. No! 
know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I get the whole pouring and taking the shape of the container, but come on. Liquids and gases, they do both of those things. Well, it all comes down to rule number three. Can you squeeze it? Now, solids, you, you, can't, you can't really squeeze them. Liquids, you can't really squeeze them. Gases, ha-ha, bam, you can squeeze them. You see, gases compress. Liquids and solids, they don't really compress very well. The other difference between gases and liquids is gases will take the shape and the volume of the container they're put in. Liquids don't do that. So there you go. Solid, liquid, gas. And the rules. Does it flow? Does it take the shape of the container? And can you squeeze it? Now you know your states of matter. That'll be 650. Cash only. So what is cornstarch mud and how does it work? Well, cornstarch mud is a non-Newtonian fluid, which means it behaves differently than you or Newton would expect. Here's cornstarch and here's water. Cornstarch is made up of large, blocky molecules like this. Water is made up of much smaller, rounder molecules like this. When you put them together, it looks something like this. It all has to do with how the molecules slide past each other. When you put light pressure or slow pressure on the mud, the water molecules and cornstarch molecules have time to shift out of the way. But when you put a sudden pressure on it, the water molecules squirt out of the way but the cornstarch molecules don't have enough time. So you get a section that's nearly all cornstarch, which acts as a solid. Cornstarch mud is a shear thickening fluid. Shear is talking about the force of things sliding around, in this case, the molecules. So when the shear force is strong, the fluid thickens. Shear thickening. So here's the plan. If Judy and I make enough cornstarch mud, could we run across it? Let's find out. Yeah, I think mine is just the right consistency. How's yours, Judy? I think I'm ready too. This is much harder than I thought. Yeah, it's really hard to get it mixed at the very beginning, but uh, yeah. mine is ready to go. Okay, here we go, Sounds first good. batch, you ready? Yep. Dump it in. Woo, woo! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm, I thought that would be more. I thought so too. It's really not filling this up very much, is it? No. Huh, that's a lot of cornstarch. This is, um, this is great, but I think we're gonna have to go a little faster than this. I think we need some sort of mixing device. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to do this by hand. We can get some sort of machine to help us. Yeah. Right on, high five. Oh. <coughs> uh, we shouldn't high five when we have this stuff on our hands. Nope. Yeah, good call. is delicious. This is rock candy. It's basically crystallized sugar, and you make it by turning a solid into a liquid and then back to a solid again. Here's how you can make it at home. You need a container that you're not gonna need for a while and some water, some sugar. You can use brown or white. I like to use brown. And an adult. Here's why you need an adult. You wanna dissolve three cups of sugar into every cup of water. And you can't do that unless you heat the water. So get an adult, a saucepan, and heat the water up, pour the sugar in, and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. Then pour it in your container and let it cool down. Then you'll need a shish kebab skewer, which is something you can get at the grocery store. Cut it down to the right size so it fits nicely into your container. And then dunk it in your sugar and get some crystals coated around the stick. These are seed crystals, and they get the whole process started. And now you have to wait for these to dry, otherwise they'll just fall off the stick when you put it in the water. So I've got one here that has dried out. You'll also want something to keep it from falling in the top of the container, so I'm gonna use a clothespin. Put it in there and dunk it in the container like that. And now for the final step, if you want, you can add food coloring. I like to use red because it reminds me of science. And I'm gonna use the stick to actually stir that up a little bit. There we go. Now, the dissolved sugar crystals in the water will slowly grow on the crystals that are already attached to the stick, and it will eventually grow into a rock candy pop. But it takes about a week. No, I'm just kidding, I've already got one that's standing by. Here we go. This one 
has been growing for about seven days. And there you go, raw candy. Delicious science. Now, how could we make this any better? I mean, it's crystallized sugar. It doesn't get any more maxed out than that, does it? Yeah, it does, come on. This is a giant container of sugar water, and I've been brewing a massive rock candy uh, crystal in it for a while, but uh, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of getting a little bit too big to fit out the top of the container, so. Uh, um, you know what, I'm just gonna put that back in there and chalk that one up to science because, well, eating a rock candy crystal that big would definitely not be good for my teeth, so, yeah. So our big experiment is to take a whole lot of cornstarch and fill a trough to see if we can run on it. But mixing it by hand was going to take forever. So Judy and I got a drill with a mixing attachment on the end. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> All right, so Judy, I'm noticing a bit of a problem here. What is it? Well, if I mix at the top, everything's fine. But as soon as I get it a little bit deeper, and then it gets really tough, and the whole bucket starts to spin, and the drill stops. Yeah, I think it's because the drill's trying to mix it too fast. When we're mixing it by hand, it's slow, and you can still let it stay a liquid, but now you're just making it a solid. Right, because it's a sheer thickening fluid, exactly. so if you hit it really quickly with something, like the blades of this spinning really quickly in the thing, it'll suddenly turn into a solid, and it'll be really hard to mix. Yep. So we go slow. Going slow. Going slow. Suddenly realizing that if we go slow, we'll be here forever. Yep. You know what I think we need? Whoa, sorry. You know what I think we need? We need a different way to mix this. Yep. We need a way to mix more of it, and we need a way that it doesn't hit it with blades that suddenly go through it really quickly. Something that can mix on a large scale, but slowly. I have just the thing. Come with me. All right. The interesting thing about bubbles is they're a gas surrounded by a liquid. So get some dish soap and some water, and then be science maximites and find things around the house that you can make bubbles out of. Just about anything that has holes will do. Or, mm -hmm. or I like this one. I call it the loud bubble. Ontario Science Center, and this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Good, so Good. you are amazing at bubbles. Uh, I am, I've been practicing for a while. Let's get started. Okay. You're gonna make an okie dokie sign like this. Uh -huh. You're gonna dip it right into our bubble solution. Make, come on, get right in okay, there, right, right in, in there. Make sure you get it all, oh, that's, that's a little too much. Well, that's then good. I can make two. And then you're gonna keep that okie dokie sign, you're gonna blow very gently. Nice. I brought these two giant sticks here, and I don't know if you noticed, but I've got a smoke machine here. Right. So we'll turn that on, and then if you press that green button there, you're gonna shoot some smoke, and we're gonna try to catch that smoke in a giant bubble. You ready? Okay, and I'm gonna try to... Oh, that was so that was close. Great. Did you see wow. that one? You give it a shot. Nice! Oh, check yeah. that out! That was amazing! <laughs> that was huge. Try it again. Let's see if I can get the smoke so machine. Here we go. Go for it, go for it. Push right towards. Oh, check that out, you did it, look at that, look at that! No. Smoke, and it, yeah. bounces, it bounces on the floor because the floor, it doesn't have any oils like our hands do. Isn't that amazing? That was oh great. my god, that was so cool. That was great. You know what I think we should do? What's that? Giant bubble, tons of smoke. Done. Okay, here we go. Let's do it, you ready? Giant bubble, tons of smoke, go. Awesome! Oh my god, look at that! Woo! Look at that, that's crazy! Max out bubble. Well, there you go. Giant smoke-filled bubbles. Awesome! Yeah! Judy and I tried mixing the cornstarch mud using a drill with a mixer attachment. 
but it didn't work. We should have known better. Here's the mixer in our cornstarch mud. Usually, a mixer works by going really fast and mixing everything together. But remember that cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid. So, when the blades of the mixer tried to go fast through the cornstarch mud, it did what it always does, turn solid. The faster and harder you try to move it, the more solid it will become. This means the only way to mix it would be if we made the drill go very, very slow, which wouldn't speed things up at all. So with the drill another lost cause, Judy and I okay. need the biggest thing around that could mix stuff up. Come on back. Good. Little bit more. Perfect. Ha 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 ha. A cement truck. A cement truck is a perfect thing to mix because all we have to do is get all the cornstarch up in here and it'll mix it and it doesn't move it too fast. It goes nice and slow. So hopefully a sheer thickening fluid will be fine. I'm gonna get Judy. She's driving the truck. Hey Judy, that's perfect. The only problem is we needed to get all of those bags of cornstarch into the hopper of the cement truck. I didn't think it'd be this messy. We needed to call the entire Science Max build team to help us out. This is possibly the messiest thing I've ever done. Awesome! Woo. Hey Judy, you wanna you wanna lift up any bags? I'm okay, thanks. That's okay. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, so uh, I can do them. Cool. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I got most of it, I got most of it. All right, I think we're done. I think that's enough bags. Let's start the mixing. So, what do you think, Judy? Do you think it's gonna work? I think so, because you're mixing at a very large volume, but at a very low speed. Yep. So throughout the process, it'll stay a liquid until we're ready to run across it. That sounds exactly like the kind of science I like to see. You know what I really like is that every time I move, more cornstarch comes off. It's like, it's like I'm a human fog machine. This is liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up most of the air we breathe, but if you get it really, really cold, it turns into a liquid. The fun thing is you can use it to make other things really, really cold too, like this banana. I have frozen this banana solid thanks to the liquid nitrogen, and normally a mushy banana would not be able to hammer in a nail, but whoa, because it's frozen, I can hammer this nail into this block of wood. So that got me wondering, if I can turn a banana into a hammer using liquid nitrogen, could I turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer? Let's find out. Pumpkin sledgehammer, take one. No, I, I think the answer is no, you cannot turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer with liquid nitrogen. All you can do is make a really, really big mess. I'm gonna have to clean this up, aren't I? Now we have a cement truck to help us do the mixing for our cornstarch mud. After making a giant mess getting the cornstarch into the cement truck, it's time to see if it worked. Hey, Phil, how's it going? Yeah, it looks like it's mixing pretty well. I'm really glad we are not doing this by hand because it'd take, a, it'd take a really long time. We've almost got it at the right consistency, but it's taken some time. But it's getting a little dark out, Judy. I don't know, do you, do you want to quit and go home? No. Of course not. That's not what we do in science. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's see it. Let's see if it's... I like how it comes down in little steps. And look, it's still, it's working just like it should. I hit it, and it's solid, but you can see it's pouring like a liquid. Yeah, here comes a big wave. Wow. Here it comes. Oh! Wow! <laughs> and it's totally filling up. Oh yeah, it's filling up really fast. 
I think we should stop pouring very soon. Yep, we may not have a big enough trough. Yep. Hey, liking it. It's good. Yep. I think it's time. It's not even done pouring, but I'm gonna try it. Okay, you ready? Whoa. <laughs> You have to get back onto the sides before you stop moving. Or else it becomes a liquid. All right, it's your turn. Okay. Here. Go. Okay, ready? Okay. You gotta, you gotta hit your feet really fast. All right. Okay, go. Yeah! Oh, that actually works. Because cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid, it means it stays a liquid until you hit it suddenly, like with your hands, or in this case, our feet. And then it turns to a solid. So as long as Judy and I keep slapping our feet down with enough force, we can walk on top of it. One more dance. All right. And let's tell do you what, it. we'll do one more dance. All right, let's do that. Okay, ready? All right. And, and go. All right. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We've done it. Solids, liquid, gases. Thanks very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large. Woo! Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. I'm Phil McCordick, and today we're going to be building one of the most devastating, one of the most powerful machines known to medieval man using a plastic spoon, among other things. We're going to be building a catapult. Catapults were used throughout history for all kinds of reasons to throw all kinds of things, but mostly big stone blocks at castle walls in order to knock them down. Here's what you need in order to build your own catapult. You need elastics, uh, pencils, um, unsharpened is fine, plastic spoons, like I said, and popsicle sticks. Popsicle, popsicle sticks, popsicle sticks. Um, I'm gonna go wash my hand. So, Here's the science behind what we're doing today. It's all about elastic force. Elasticity is a property of solid materials, like this elastic, and how much they tend to return to their original shape when deformed, like when I pull on it. Elastics are called elastics because they're great at doing just that. You can pull on it and pull on it and pull on it, and it'll, ow, 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 always return to its original shape. So we are using the power of elastic force today. Ow. Now it's time for a Science Max quiz. Elasticity is the ability for a material to return to its original shape when deformed, like this or this. Which of these materials have elasticity? A rubber band, a pencil, or a rock? Haha! -ha, this is a trick question. The answer is all three. Most solid materials have elasticity. Nearly everything will deform a little and still be able to return to its original shape. It all depends on how much. This is a steel bar. This is an elastic band. And this is an ice cream sundae. We're not talking about ice cream sundaes now, though. So get that out of here. Good. Now a steel bar and an elastic band both have elasticity. A steel bar can be stretched to 1% of its length and still spring back. A rubber band can be stretched 300% or more. The difference between the two is why we make balls out of rubber and buildings out of steel. Because the other way around wouldn't be good for balls or buildings. This has been a Science Max quiz. All right, let's build our catapult. The first step, take four pencils and stick your popsicle stick in between so you have two on the top and two on the bottom. And then use your elastic to go around and around and around. That's why I like building things with elastics because it makes it very fast to tie things together because once you go around and you have it nice and tight, you just pop it over the end and voila, it stays together. And that is how you start making your frame. Put more pencils on that side and another popsicle stick on the other end held on at the corners with more elastics. Then take even more elastics and put them right around the middle until you get 
this. I've added a few more elastics around the middle here, and that is where we're gonna get all of our elastic force. I think I have six. The more you use, the better it's going to work. Take your popsicle stick, stick in between the elastics, and then start spinning it around. Here's the reason I use pencils and popsicle sticks is because the pencils are a little bit longer, which allows you to twist the popsicle stick around in the middle and build up the elastic force. Now, because I'm twisting, the elastic force we're using here is called torsion or twisting force. When you feel you have enough torsion, pull your popsicle stick down a little bit so it won't unwind on you, and you'll see that you have all kinds of elastic energy. Then, take your spoon and stick it on the popsicle stick, and you can also break off the popsicle stick if you wanna make sure it's the right length. And it works like that. To make the frame, you just need more pencils and elastics. The trick is to make a triangle with two pencils attached to your frame. They should stick up right where your catapult arm would be fully upright. Then, take a final pencil and put it across the top. Don't forget to pull the arm back before you put the pencil across, otherwise it'll end up on the wrong side. Now, this is very complicated and I went pretty fast, so if you want the step-by-step -step instructions on exactly how to build this, go to our website. And there you go, a catapult of your very own that you can use to knock down very small castle walls. I've also built a larger catapult using all of the same principles. Pretty good, huh? It's got a longer arm, which means I can throw marshmallows even further, whoa, or I can throw larger marshmallows, or I can throw very large marshmallows. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, is that the largest catapult you're gonna make? Well, of course not. This is Science Max, experiments at large. I'm headed to the Center for Skills Development and Training, and we're gonna max out the catapult so that it's big enough to throw one of these. Hey, Phil. How you doing? All right. This is Zach. He's a mechanical engineer, and you build machines for a living, right? That's right. Great, because I need help building a catapult. OK, but what's with the pumpkin? Well, the pumpkin is what I want to throw out of the catapult. Um, see, I figure we just take the small design, and we just make it so that we can throw one of these. What do you think? You're going to need a really big catapult. Yeah, and I'm also going to need some really big elastics. Where do you get those? Well. In medieval times, they used rope to make large catapults. Oh, okay, well, rope is a lot easier to get, and that would be fine. Uh, and I want to make this arm uh, as long as this piece of wood here. This is going to be a huge catapult. It's a huge catapult. I guess you should build it outside, though, huh? Let's do it. Okay, it's, it's over that way. Okay. I'll follow you. Sure, do you want a hand with that? No, no, I'm fine. You go ahead, and okay. I'll, I'll just... Maybe if you hold the door open for me, I could... Just hold... No, it's... You know what? You go, and I'll, I'll meet you. Make sure you go. Our full-size catapult is going to look a lot like the popsicle stick version. We start with a four-sided frame and add some legs on the bottom. Our spoon is going to be replaced by a long throwing arm with a basket on the end. Then we need a really strong cross brace at the top to stop the arm. Just like in the small version, using a triangle shape is the best because triangles are very strong. Finally, we need something to wind around and around, which is going to give us our elastic force. Instead of elastics, we're gonna be using rope for our catapult because rope has just the right amount of elasticity. But unlike medieval times, we're gonna be catapulting pumpkins. Once Zach and I got it all put together, it looked like this. Okay, we have built a catapult. Check it out. It's pretty solid and I think it's pretty amazing. And just like in the small catapult, we have 
our elastic force. But this time we're using rope, right, Zach? Yes. Okay, and rope will work as well as the elastic did in the small one? Yeah. All right, great. So what do we do? It's really well, we loose now. We need to wind this up so oh that we God. put some okay, tension into it. it. Go! The reason a catapult works is because the rope is twisted. The elasticity in the rope wants to unwind, which gives the catapult its power. Just like the small wind catapult, it. the more like you that. wind it, the better it works. Good. Usually in medieval days, they had whole teams of people doing this job, <laughs> but it's just me and Zach now. How are you doing, Zach? All right. OK. And then we clamp it on here. So the thing doesn't unwind, right? Yeah. Good. All right. Now we have our pumpkin. And we're going to fire our pumpkin in our castle wall, which is made out of cardboard boxes over there. Pumpkin. All right, here we go. Pulling the arm back. Oh, oh. that elastic force is pretty strong. Okay, how do you think we? Do you think that pumpkin's a good size? Oh, it's pretty big. You think? Oh, a little it's too big. Too, it's too big for our basket. Yeah. Smaller pumpkin. Smaller pumpkin. I'll hold this. No rush, Zach. No rush. Oh, okay, uh, rush, Zach. Uh, Can't hold. Oh yeah. Man. Can't hold arm. Okay, ready? One, two, three. It didn't work that well. No, um, not quite that well. Yeah, so it went and it flew and it landed here, which is a little farther yeah, away from the wall than I'd short. like it to be. One third of the way to the wall. I don't know if that's enough. What do we do to make it better? Well, the way we're throwing it right now, we just have the pumpkin in a, you know, at the end of the arm. So yep. if we bake, make some kind of a sling so that we fling it as we're bringing it up. We make a sling? Yes. All right, I don't know how to make a sling, but you know how? Sure. All right, we'll make it, and then you can explain how it works. Yeah. All right, good. Let's put the pumpkin over here. We'll put it, we'll recycle it later. Max Historica. Good morrow to you. I am Lord Fillington III, and welcome to my medieval castle. Throughout history, lords and kings have built castles and walls to keep people out. I built my castle to protect my prize collection of snow globes. I have so very many, and they're all mine. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, hello. You down there. You can't come in. This is my castle. And throughout history, there have been people who've been wanting to get into those castles because Lord Fillington has been hogging all the snow globes, and I'd, well, I'd like to look at them. But the odd part is figuring out how to get into the castle, because I can't just come up to the wall and start hammering on it. Huh? Taste the wrath of my water balloon! Because, because if I get too close to the castle, he can get me. Ha 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 ha! Fortunately, there's this thing called a catapult. Oh, fiddlesticks. They have a catapult. What you do is you put something heavy in the end here, and the catapult fires it at the walls of the castle, knocks them down, all from far enough away that the people in the castle can't get to you. Ah! Oh, I surrender! Don't knock my walls down! Oh, it'll take me all week to fix them! Oh! All right, all right, you can have a snow globe. <laughs> and that's how catapults were used in history. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> Back to our maxed out catapult. Our first design threw a pumpkin just like it was supposed to, except it only threw it one third of the way to the wall. Now Zach and I are planning to outfit the catapult with a sling. The sling attaches to the end of the throwing arm and gives the pumpkin a lot more distance to travel. Because the pumpkin is traveling a longer distance in the same amount of time, it will be going faster, which will hopefully get it to the wall, or at least a lot farther than before. So we built this sling. How does this work, Zach? Well, we've got one end tied here. Yeah. And then we put the pumpkin in here. Wait, wait. OK, pulling arm down. Pulling arm down. <sighs> OK, yeah, now what? Now we put the pumpkin in here. Put the pumpkin in there. Yeah. And then we loop this over the back of the, oh. over that. 
As the throwing arm goes up, this will slide off the back of the throwing arm and it will release the pumpkin. All right, you're the expert, I believe you. Let's try it out. Three, two, one. Oh. Whoa! Okay, that Better. works really well. You know what the problem is, though? We still don't have enough oomph. Yeah, it needs more power. Need, well, so what do we do? Should, I don't know if we can crank that rope anymore. Uh, I think we're at the limit of our rope power, but if we added some more elastic... I thought we weren't going to use elastic. Well, we used elastics in our small demo model, so what if we use some more? We have got, elastics? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I brought have... some in here, just in case. What's this? It's uh, surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic! Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this is elastic force, so do we... Do we... Twist well, here, it around can, at the bottom there? Well, or? we just wrap it around the throwing arm like this. And... Oh, I see. So we tie yeah. it here. Yeah, we just need a lot more. And then and then we pull this, and it would be, oh, yeah. That would yeah. make a lot more. So we just need a lot more of this elastic. Uh, what is what is this again? Surgical tubing. Surgical tubing. It's like a giant elastic. Fantastic. All right. Goggles on. Goggles on. Yes. Yes. Here's another fun way you can play with elastic force. Take a milk carton. I prefer Science Max Milk because it's the creamiest. 2% cream, 100% science. Wrap some elastic bands around it with some popsicle sticks on the bottom, sort of like feet. Then take some clamshell packaging, which wraps just about anything you buy nowadays, and cut out a square or a rectangle. Then wrap some tape around that square with an elastic in it and put the elastic on the feet of your milk carton. Then wind it around and make sure you go backwards so your paddle wheel boat will go forwards when you put it in the water. And there you go, a paddle wheel boat. Now it is time to max it out. Elastic Force Paddle Wheel Boat Mattress. I need, I need a, a better name. But I've made a giant paddle wheel boat that will work on Elastic Force because I've got surgical tubing as my elastics, and that's an air mattress. And then I use some lumber to hold it all together. And of course, I need a paddle wheel. And what better thing to use in a pool than a flutterboard? Okay, here we go. So normally you're not allowed to wear your clothes and your shoes in the pool, but I got special permission because of signs. Besides, I'm not worried at all, so I didn't wear my swimming outfit because I figure I can totally do this entire experiment without even getting wet. That is how confident I am. All right, now the tricky part, We'll be getting on to the mattress. OK, here we go. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh -oh. uh -huh. <laughs> the SS Science! Hey, SS Science, that's a great name for this. Look, it works great. And I managed to stay totally dry. Huh? Well, almost. Whoa, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> you thought I was going to fall in the pool, but I didn't. Uh-oh. My flutterboard has, has stopped moving, and I'm, I'm in the middle of the pool. Almost. Yeah. Didn't think this through. No. 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 No, that's not going to work. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll wait. Our maxed out catapult was working well with the sling we attached to it, but it still didn't make it all the way to the wall. Zach's idea is to attach a bunch of surgical tubing to the cross piece of the catapult. Surgical tubing is pretty much big elastics, so we'll have two places we're getting elastic force from, the rope and the surgical tubing. Hopefully this design is enough to help our catapult fling a pumpkin far enough to hit the castle wall. All right, here we go. Uh, you hold that. I uh, get this. We got our system down now. OK. Oh. This goes up to there. OK. OK. 
Three, two, one. Nope. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, 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 it went too far. It went too far. We are, that's so good. Oh man. Okay, so all we gotta do is move the catapult back. So you get that side, I'll get this side, and we'll move the catapult. See, now our catapult is too good. We gotta back it away from the castle. All right. Let's go again! Aha! Pumpkin! Pumpkin. Pulling arm back! Pulling arm back. Uh, grunting. Yeah. Loading! Pumpkin! Loading. Hooking rope on arm! Hooking rope on arm, more grunting. More grunting! Uh, pulling back strongly. One, two, three! Oh! Oh! Oh, wow! <laughs> We're inside the castle. We're still inside the castle. Oh man, it's an excellent shot though. So what do we do, move the catapult back? Yeah. Move the catapult back! What about right here? Here. Here we go again. Pumpkin! Pumpkin? Loading arm. Loading arm. Food. All right, you ready? You think it's gonna work? We've got, we've done every modification we can possibly do. So you think it's gonna work this we time? We did it, it's gonna work. Okay, here we go, I'm excited. All right, ready? Ready. One, two, three. Whoa! Yeah! Woohoo! High fives! Well, there you have it. Awesome job. Now we need to throw fingers to see who gets to rebuild the castle, okay? One, two, three! Oh, thanks very much for joining us. Let's just take a break, I'll rebuild the castle. <laughs> you see, this is exactly how catapults used to work. They'd hit the same part of the wall over and over until they made a big hole and that would weaken the wall. Fortunately for me, it's really easy to fix. Uh, just put this right in here. Oh man. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be looking at gravity. What goes up must come down. Today, gravity is the force that makes things fall <laughs> towards the ground. But just because it's a force of nature doesn't mean that we have to listen to it. No! Today on Science Max, experiments at large, we're gonna use everything in the power of science to defy gravity! Ha <laughs> ha! We are going to be making a hoop glider. Now, hoop gliders may not look like much, but they fly just like paper airplanes. Woohoo! And here's how you can make a hoop glider. Here's how you can make a hoop glider all your own. This is what you need. Index cards, scissors, straw, ruler, pencil, and of course, science tape, which is just like regular tape, except you use this kind of tape for science. So, here's how you do it. Take your index card and cut it into three equal lengths. Take two strips, and you take your science tape, and you tape those two strips and make a hoop out of it. And with the small strip, you wanna make another hoop. Now, what you wanna do is take your straw. Now this straw has a little scoop at the end and that's not very aerodynamic, so we're gonna get rid of that. Ooh, maybe it was kinda aerodynamic. All right, now that we've got the straw, you have to align the hoop and the straw together. So here's what I like to do. Take some science tape and stick it on the straw and then align it so that it's perfectly straight, and then stick it on. Looks straight to me, all right? The small hoop also has to be perfectly aligned with the first hoop. So again, put the tape on the strap first, then align them up, and then start looking down through it, make sure it's aligned. There. Once you have it all taped together, you're done, your hoop glider. And it flies just like a paper airplane. Boom! Awesome! So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna 
We're gonna, oh yeah, I gotta clean that up. We are going to max out the hoop glider. I'm gonna go meet Sonia at the Ontario Science Center and mm -hmm. we are going to max out the hoop glider into a giant version. We'll probably have to change the materials we use because oh, I don't think we can get a straw that big or cardboard, but still, we can figure it out. All right, here I go. Aha! Oh, hi, Bill! Good! What? Pardon? I wanted to do an experiment. I wanted to do an experiment. You want me to help you with an experiment? Oh, Sonia, I came in. Bill, you came in you, here? I came are you in. okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Come on, let me show you. Okay. This is what I would like to max out. It was in my pocket when I fell, so. What is it, that? It, it's a hoop glider. It was a hoop glider. So, how do we max this out? First, we're gonna need a larger tube. To large replace tube. the straw, yeah. Exactly, and we're gonna need two hoops. So, we need something that's flexible that will convert into a hoop. Okay, that's great. So uh, why don't we get started? Sounds good. All right, high All fives. Right. You may recognize this. It is a spring. Yes, good for you. But did you know that springs can defy gravity? Whoa. Gravity def defy. Gravity defy. Gravity defy. Look at it fly! Defying. Okay, not exactly, but what if I was to hold the spring like this and let it go? What'll happen? It'll fall. Yes, it'll fall. That's, that is true. But while it's falling, what happens to this end? Does it stay in one place? Does it go up or does it go down? Let's find out. I'll bring this in so you can really see it. Okay, ready? Watch close. Did you see? Did you, no? Okay, tell you what. We'll watch it again, this time in slow motion. See? The bottom doesn't move, and here's why. When the top of the spring is released, gravity and the tension of the spring are pulling on it. The bottom of the spring is being pulled down by gravity and up by the tension of the spring. These forces cancel out, stopping the bottom of the spring from falling until the top reaches it. Until there's no more tension, and then the top passes the bottom and the whole thing falls. That is how it works. But here is the real question. Will it happen differently with a longer spring? Huh? Well, I just happen to have a longer spring! Let's max it out! Don't tangle it. So, now that I'm up high on this fire escape, let's test it out. Okay, three, two, one, go! A longer spring still has the same forces working on it. The tension of the spring pulling it up and gravity pulling it down. No matter what size of spring, these forces cancel out for the bottom of the spring until the top meets up with it. So there you go, an almost gravity-defying spring! <laughs> uh, hey, there's no door handle on this door. I guess I have to take the stairs. Whoa. Sonia and I are maxing out the hoop glider out of bigger and better materials. This is the largest tube I have, right? A giant ABS pipe and some bendable metal to make into hoops. Then we attach them all together and... Okay, big hoop is done. And little hoop is also done. Awesome. Not bad. Not bad at all, super solid. 
and that's the thing. We have pretty heavy materials, so it might not fly as well as we'd like. But something heavy can always be good, right? <sighs> oh, no. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> See how solid it is? It's pretty no solid. No damage whatsoever. You want to test it? I think we should. OK. I'm excited. We take our plastic and metal hoop glider outside to test it, and... Ready? Ready! One, two, two three! Huh. huh. It didn't really fly, did it? Sonia and I made a very solid design, but the problem with it became pretty obvious. Yeah. It's just too heavy. Well, that's what science is. Back to the drawing board. Here's something fun you can do if you ever get your hands on a helium balloon. Now, helium balloons float up, not because they defy gravity, but because they're lighter than air. It's because the heavier air around it actually falls past the balloon, and that ends up pushing the balloon up. But what if this helium balloon wasn't lighter than air or heavier than air? It was exactly the same. This is what I like to do. Just take a helium balloon with a long ribbon, and a bunch of paper clips, and adding a little bit of weight every time. And what we want to do is make this balloon neutrally buoyant. That means it won't go up or down, but it will be neutral. You want to check it every once in a while. Let's see, three paper clips is clearly not enough. Five paper clips is, ooh, five paper clips is pretty close. It still might float down. So you want to take off just a little bit of weight Maybe about there. Watch this. You just take the balloon, and you put it somewhere, and it stays. It stays put. It doesn't go up. It doesn't go down. It's attached to nothing. Now, let's max it out. Huh. I had a big balloon, and it was a, we had a, oh, there. <laughs> a giant balloon, and look, it's a great paper towel delivery device. Say, did you want some paper towel? Here you go. Science. Yeah, don't worry about Ramona, just put them up high. Put them up, yeah, higher, good. Hey. Gravity. Gravity. Huh? Gravity makes things fall. Well, where do they fall? They fall down. Oh. Towards the center of the Earth. Yeah. It fell, didn't it? So, the Earth causes gravity, right? Well, yes, gravity. Oh, not... Come on. Everything that has mass has gravity. Gravity. But the Earth has so much mass that the gravity produced by everything else is like nothing. I mean, forget about it. But let's say I was in space with, uh, with this chicken. I would have gravity, and I could exert a gravitational force on this chicken. And if I get my angles right, I might be able to get the chicken to orbit me, like, like a moon. Behold, my chicken moon, huh? Gravity. But let's get serious. What causes gravity? We don't know! Ah! But what we do know is that without gravity, there would be no universe as we know it. No you, no me, no chicken moon. I'd miss my chicken moon. Chicken moon, you want gravity. Like it or not, the universe wouldn't exist without it. You like the sign? I'll give you a good deal. Uh. Half off. Back to our hoop glider, which was too heavy. Here's what I don't get. This is heavy, but I can still pick it up and throw it. Yep. An airplane is way heavier. I could never pick up an airplane, but that can fly. And that's because airplanes have engines, so it has a constant source of thrust. When we throw it, we just have an initial source of thrust, so we're throwing it. Eventually, it loses its energy, therefore, it falls to the ground. I see. So we need something that's light. Light. And something that's strong. And strong. OK, well, let's see what we can find. All right. Sonia and I try a plastic tube and some heavy-duty paper. 
we make hoops and attach them with some duct tape and run outside to try it out. Hoop lighter dance! Okay, three, two, one! Let's try that again. <laughs> Here we go. I throw the hoop glider and although it doesn't keep flying forever, it goes much further than our first version and also further than I could have just thrown the pipe by itself. Pretty good. So we've done a good job of making something that flies. Why don't we make a couple different kinds out of different materials and we'll see if we can get one that flies even better than this. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Sony and I have created a pretty good maxed out hoop glider, but we wanted to see if different materials would make an even better one. Sonia made a much lighter version. This time I used cardboard. And I, I made this, made a slightly heavier one. Let's do it. Okay, three, yeah. two, one, go! Not bad. My turn. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't really go very far at all, did it? No. Okay, so now we can measure it against the one that we threw before. And see that went pretty far. This went pretty far to see yeah. if we've got a better design here. Here we go. Right? Wow. Awesome! So, heavy one, no. Light one, no. Interesting. Uh, no. This design seems to be the best one. I keep thinking about how you were talking about thrust. Yep. All the thrust that we can put in is just what we can put in with one throw. Yeah. What if we could give it more thrust than that? How can we do that? Um, I don't know, like some sort of uh, slingshot or something. Like, a, it'd have to be a pretty big slingshot. A pretty though. big slingshot. Do you but think I think that a, sounds great, though. I think we make a big slingshot for this? Why not? OK, high five. Let's All do right. it. <laughs> is an egg. Eggs do not like to be dropped. Oh, fortunately, we can use the power of science to design something that'll keep the egg safe as it falls. Behold, my egg drop contraptions. The thing I really like about this experiment is there's no wrong way to do this. You can come up with any design you want and see if it works. This one here is a bunch of helium balloons. This structure is just to keep the helium balloons on so the egg can touch down very gently. Here it goes. Whoa. <laughs> and, and the egg is unharmed. Miraculously sound. That one worked really well. Success. This is a giant helium balloon that I think will work pretty much the same way because I think this balloon will drop just slowly enough that the egg can actually just touch and nothing will happen. Um, so that didn't work. <laughs> and then there's this one, which has no slowing at all. It's all designed to just absorb the impact. And the idea is that the cone will crumple and absorb the force when it hits the bottom. Oh, no! Oh, oh, no. I think it would have worked if it hadn't turned in the air, but it did, and, well, I guess the egg is completely broken. So I'd call that one a fail. This one is the parachute. You see the egg has been nestled into this foam container, and this is a parachute that will hopefully slow the egg down. Woo! Uh oh. Whoa. Over. Over. Good. And. <laughs> that one seemed to work well. Yep. The egg is totally fine. <laughs> the parachute worked. All right. Egg drop experiment. Totally fun experiment to do. But the question is how do we max it out? And the answer is pumpkin drop. <laughs> Same thing, except with a pumpkin instead of an egg. Come on. OK. Ha, ha, ha. All right, pumpkin drop with everything attached all at once. OK, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. So what we've learned from this is the heavier something is, the more force is acting on it from gravity, which means the harder it is to slow down when it's falling. OK, fair enough. 
You win this one, Gravity, but I'll beat you next time. I'm, I'm gonna get a broom. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. <laughs> Delicious. Nothing is more important to have fresh than your seafood. It's what makes the difference between a fresh fish... <laughs> ah, ..and one that isn't so fresh. <laughs> <coughs> If you live by the ocean, you probably know that the water gets high tide and low tide. Look closely, it's the same location. Amazing! Oh. But did you know that this is caused by the gravity of the moon and the sun? Say this cookie is the Earth. And this little happy fellow is me. Hello! <laughs> and this string represents the water around the Earth. If we didn't have gravity to worry about, the water would all be equally deep around the Earth. But here comes the moon, this mushroom. Now, the moon has gravity, and that pulls the oceans towards it a little bit, like this. And that creates high tide there, and low tide here, and a little bump of high tide on the other side of the Earth. And as the Earth rotates and I'm on it, I experience low tide and high tide and low tide and high tide. Very interesting. But there's another factor. The sun, or oh. this lemon. Now, the sun also affects the tides, but not as much as the moon. <laughs> now, the sun does not affect the tides as much as the moon, because it's much further away. But it still has an effect. If the sun was here, then the tides would be pulled away a little bit like that, and the tides would be less severe. But if the moon and the sun line up, like over here, you'd get a very, very high tide and very, very low tide. So there you are. That's how the tides are affected by the gravity of the moon and the sun. Mmm, delicious. I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Our maxed out hoop glider was working pretty well. That was pretty amazing. Good. But we could only give it so much thrust by throwing it. Yeah! So we came up with the perfect Science Max solution. Our giant slingshot! <laughs> All right. We pull the bungee cord back and hook it onto our hoop glider. I am ready to fire. Count me down. Three, two, launch it! <laughs> Our slingshot is amazing. By giving the glider more thrust, that is, more energy at the beginning so it's going faster when we launch it, the glider soars through the air and flies a long way. That was great! So there you go, giant hoop glider! Yeah! Science Max, experiments at large, nicely done. Nice. What more could you ask for? Well, it's my turn. Hey, see you next time! <laughs>